All right, welcome everybody. This is the Great Plains Google Educator Group uh, December Hangout on Air. My name is Mickey Mueller. I'm one of the co-moderators for the group. I am also the Educational Technology Facilitator for Norfolk Public Schools in Norfolk, Nebraska, and I am a Google for Education certified trainer. Now, normally you see me joined by Otis, uh, the other co-moderator of the group, but he is in Savannah, Georgia today, enjoying what I'm sure is such uh, more beautiful weather than what we're having. So uh, I have a special guest with me today, a colleague, a coworker of mine. Becky, go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, I am Becky Miller. I am the Digital Integration Facilitator here at Norfolk Public Schools for Special Education. And I am also a NIDA board member. So I was uh, able to wrangle Becky into joining me today so that I wouldn't have to do this all by myself for this month. Um, but um, in addition to Becky being a coworker of mine, uh, she and I also both really enjoy the Hour of Code and what it can do with stud for students. So we're gonna talk about our uh, topic for this month is the Hour of Code, and we're gonna do it Google style. So first of all, we're gonna kind of give you an overview of what the Hour of Code is. If you're not familiar with that, we're gonna talk about why we would want kids to code. We're going to talk about some different apps and websites that you have um, options to use for the Hour of Code. But uh, we're going to also give you a demo today of some Google coding tools that you could utilize during the Hour of Code. So that's kind of our plan for today. Um, Becky, let's kind of get started and let's talk a little bit about what is the Hour of Code and how it got started and, and where it is now. So my understanding, or at least when we started um, with the Hour of Code, it was this, this movement by um, computer science education and code.org to try to get kids to code for an hour, try out computer programming, and try it across the, try it across the country. Yes, I am um, letting people know that we're live right now. So Perfect, perfect. Yeah, we, when we first started and the first time that I had done Hour of Code, we, uh, we did use a lot of code.org resources and that's where we had found a lot, of, uh, a lot of the stats as far as getting kids interested in and even getting girls, getting more girls interested in coding. Yeah, um, you know, I think this real, this movement really started to take form about three years ago, and it's really gained steam. And Becky's right, the reason behind it is because, I, and I just saw a stat, I just used this stat um, this week, as a matter of fact, um, there's over 500,000 computing jobs available in the United States, and we don't have enough workers to fill those jobs. And if you think about it, every single possible job that your kids could potentially go into has something to do with computers. And while they may not all end up being programmers, um, I think learning how to code or learning how to program is really just about learning how to think, how to think critically. And those skills can help students no matter what area they go into, whether it's you know, a specific computer programmer, computer coder, or any job that they might have. Everybody needs that ability to think critically. And I think the hour of code and what it's done for that particular movement has been huge. It, it definitely has. I can see as my kids start doing things, they you start watching them and how they think and how they problem solve. And that is such an important skill for our kids to have today. And so when you see them start doing this coding, because you're right, I, I've had kids say, well, I'm not going to be a computer programmer. Why do I have to do this? Or why should I do this? And, you know, the jobs is a big thing with those. I mean, because you're right, that 500,000 is huge. So, I mean, for your high school kids, if you want a guaranteed job, I'm like, this is the best way to start. But even for your, your younger ones, that just to watch them start those problem solvings and to think and how they think through things is so important. Yeah, and it's so fun to watch, actually. Um, you might think that computer science or computer programming, well, that's definitely a high school student kind of thing. Oh no, it's not. Um, last year during Hour of Code, we had kindergartners coding. And uh, my good friend, our good friend Craig Badura, um, he and I were talking about this this topic last year and he was kind of slow to get to grasp, to join the Hour of Code movement. But once he used it, and he was using it with kindergartners, and he heard the conversations that these kids were having when they were trying to help each other get through the mazes and get through the puzzles, he's like, this is something. This is amazing that these kids, this young, can be having those types of conversations. 
Well, and the like you said, the partnering. When you watch those kids start partnering and those cooperation skills and how they feed off of each other, it's it's really magical to watch. Exactly. And people are going to say, well, I don't, I'm not one to one. I don't have enough devices for all of my kids. Well, code.org, they actually recommend partner programming. And that's where you pair kids up. You give them one device and they're helping each other go through the tutorials and go through the mazes and solve the puzzles. So um, it's important to note, you know, I think we have a um, perception that if you think about a computer programmer, you know, you think about a nerd uh, sitting in a cubicle somewhere all by themselves just typing away at a computer. And that is so not what computer programming is all about. No computer program has ever been written in isolation. That's a team process. You know, there are multiple people working on the apps and the, and the uh, websites and the programs that we're using to make those things functional. So it's very collaborative. Coding is a very collaborative thing. So to bring that into your your classroom as a collaborative activity is a great idea. Definitely. And, you know, along with that collaboration, I, I really liked that code.org had the option for um, to do or to do the coding, you know, unplugged. I liked that they, they could do, they have instructions and stuff. So if you're saying, you know, I don't have devices or I can't check out devices to get to my room, there are instructions to go through and do activities where you don't have to have, you know, what we think of traditional devices as iPads or Chromebooks, you know, in your classrooms. Yeah, I think that's a great point also to do those unplugged activities. Um, you know, you could have uh, students program each other. You know, give them a series of commands that they have to follow and see if the other student can follow that. And they know that, you know, if the kid runs into a wall, whoops, I didn't make that command exactly right. And that's, you know, about, that's learning about how a computer works. A computer can't do anything unless it's told what to do and how to do it. And that's really the essence of computer programming or computer coding. So those kind of unplugged activities are just as good to add into your classroom as the activities that you would use with a device. Um, there is a company called Little coder and um, they have created a set of cards um, programming cards and there are a series of commands each command on a different card and they do that unplugged programming with their kids and so they lay out a series of cards and the other student has to follow that series and they can go back and make changes to the code and that's a good first step into coding and that's little coder now that does um, there it, it does cost to purchase those cards and I don't remember um, how much it is but you can absolutely look into that kind of an activity for some unplugged coding activities. Definitely, and they're getting those great skills anyway. You're still practicing those programming, that thinking through, and you don't have to have the devices. You know, Becky, I think we've hit on this a little bit. Um, you know, I think when teachers hear coding or programming, I think your immediate thought goes to a high school class and that you're doing it in high school. What ages are right for programming or coding? Well. I always say all ages. So I um, I have done this in a preschool classroom. Um, I was kind of like uh, not really ready, and I'm like, but I've done it with my kindergartners, and I said, okay, let's let's try it with these preschoolers, and um, even my own children. So for um, my kids, my two and boys, their their birthday, their four year old birthday, I I purchased Caterpillar for them. And I was amazed at the, you know, and that's not traditional coding, but it's those first steps of putting pieces, you know, together and turning right and left and, and going straight. And, and I was amazed at how intuitive these kids are in that preschool classroom and then even in my own children to see how they, they pick it up so fast and they can do those step by step and, and they think and you can watch them think just like, just like your older kids. Yeah, you actually see the kids thinking, and that is what yes. is so cool. Um, you know, we do have a couple of viewers right now, and uh, Taryn Retzlaff, our amazing language arts teacher here at the senior high, and one act play director extraordinaire uh, just tweeted. So I don't know if she's still watching, but Taryn, thanks for the shout out. We're glad you're with us. Um, so back to the Coda Pillar. Um, I think Coda Pillar is, and who is that? Play School? Is that a Play School product? Yeah. Yeah. Fisher Price. Yeah. Fisher Price. Yeah. Um, I think Coda Pillar is one of the gifts of the uh, Christmas season this year. And that's probably targeting, like Becky said, her kids are four years old, um, but I could see that up into kindergarten. Um, and you snap the little pieces together and whatever pieces together you snap together, that's how the um, Coda Pillar moves. Um, you could put up obstacles and have the kids have to get around the obstacles. Um, but again, I could see that being used in a kindergarten classroom too. 
Oh, very much so. And and I think that is the goal behind it. I mean, you make obstacle courses and, and it is it is geared for ages three to six. Um, so definitely very appropriate for those for those little people. Yeah, um, last year in Northwood Public Schools, uh, we did a really big push to celebrate the Hour of Code. And so at, by the end, we had over 2,000 students, which is about half of our student body, um, participated in some way in the Hour of Code. And uh, one of our elementary buildings, Jefferson, uh, they are one-to-one. -one. They use iPads in grades K through K K through two, and they use Chromebooks in grades three and four. They did Hour of Code for an entire week. Um, and so we had every single kid in that building coding. And my favorite classes to go into were the kindergarten classrooms because they were so cute. Um, just, and, but the thinking that was going on, you know, and these kids could, some of these kids could zip through these mazes like it was nothing. And it was just amazing to watch. And um, at Jefferson, that was one of the high, most highly talked about activities by the students was our hour of code. So we're gonna repeat that again. Um, and by the way, I don't think we've actually mentioned the dates of hour of code this year, have we Becky? No, I don't think we have. It is normally, or this year, it'll be the week of December 5th. Right, yeah, December 5th through the 12th, and that is the, the official Hour of Code week. But I will give you a tip in that. Um, last year, during that official Hour of Code week, they had so many people trying to hit those those tutorials um, that it really caused some problems, especially like Monday and Tuesday. So keep that in mind. If you're gonna celebrate Hour of Code during that Hour of Code week, you know, maybe hold off until Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, or even just celebrate it at another time. At Jefferson, we're gonna to happen to do it the week after the official week, but anytime during the month of December, it's great to celebrate the Hour of Code. Yes, we and we have done that in my previous previous district. We did that. We kind of schedule it and separate it out a little bit just to make sure that things worked. And I mean, what an awesome problem to have, you know, that we have so many people trying to code and so many kids that are getting this experience that, you know, we're planning to, you know, spread it out because there are so many kids. Right. And I will tell you that um, code.org is probably the first place that you want to go to learn about um, coding and the activities. They really, they're really a one-stop shop. Um, they have a lot of tutorials that they have done themselves, but other companies and groups and organizations have submitted tutorials to be listed on their website. They have lots of teacher resources and teacher materials. So that's really the first place you should go if you're looking at doing this. And then from there, you can find a lot of other companies and groups are doing uh, coding uh, tutorials for students specifically for the hour of code. But code.org is really where you should start um, when you're looking for activities or information on coding with your students. Right. Code, and code.org is that great resource whether you've done this for, you know, all three years or if you are just starting out. I mean, that is the go-to spot. You can, it's very easy, I think, to navigate as far as what's there. And so once you get to those, all those activities, that's, that's the go-to spot. Exactly. Now, Becky, um, I actually am, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm a huge computer nerd. And um, I actually have a computer science minor. And so I did programming in college. I mean, COBOL and Fortran and Pascal, which are languages that are old school. So I did all of that in college. So I love this stuff. But let's say you were a teacher who was intrigued by the idea, but you didn't have any background in programming or coding. Could you still do this with your students? Absolutely. I have run into this numerous times where these teachers say, I, no, I, I'm not good I, I, with computers. I, I can't do this. And that is absolutely not true. Like we talked about, the code.org is the great way to start. It's got some very basic tutorials. And then if, if um, we've always said the Angry Birds one um, is probably my favorite, and it's the easiest one to start off with. And you don't have to be an expert. Let the kids help you. They learn it. They are so intuitive when it comes to that. Let them help guide where the process goes. Yeah, I think that's a good point. You know, let the kids take over. Now, I do think it's important as a teacher that you have gone through the tutorials ahead of time and make sure that you understand um, the process going through. But yeah, let your kids be the guide. Uh, they'll get into this and they'll take over and they'll love it. And the idea, again, is that you give your students a chance to program or code for an hour. Now, um, and, and maybe that's all you do. You just do, do it for an hour in your classroom and that's it. But you 
apps, there are so many activities on code.org that you absolutely could expand that way beyond an hour and add those kinds of things into your classroom. You know, and I think every subject area could um, utilize coding in some way. Obviously, math and science, super simple to integrate that into your classroom. But what about language arts or art, um, music? Are there ways that those teachers can use coding in their classroom? Oh, definitely. Um, we talked even about um, working with different programs to do some coding as far as writing prompts. And how cool would that be? So it's, it's not just a math thing. It's not just a science thing. You can use this in all areas. I mean, art, it blends itself naturally as far as, I mean, colors and lines and shapes and, and programming those and how they look and the different commands to make your you know, art project look differently. Yeah, so it definitely could be used in any curriculum area, any grade level, and any age level. So we've already kind of alluded to code.org, and I know that our topic here today was our code Google style, and we're getting real close to that part of it, but let's talk about some other apps or sites that we really like, that we've used with kiddos before, um, some other sites that we would recommend for coding. Yes, I will tell you, um, two of my favorites have um, always been Codable, and um, that one's a little blue monster guy, um, and the kids like look at him. And then the Foos um, is another one that we've used, and, and that one has been really successful. I think, uh, personally, I think it gets harder a little bit faster for the kids, um, but it's, a, it's, another, it's another monster, I guess, and he's got horns, and, and the, but the kids love him, and you just go through step by step. And so those are two of my favorites for, for littles. Yeah, and those are actually really designed for pre-readers. So if you've got kindergartners, preschool kids, Codable is my absolute favorite. I just love the activities in that app. And if you access, um, those are both um, apps for iOS devices, but you can also access those online as well. So if you're using Chromebooks, you can access those online. Um, and both of those provide great resources for teachers. So be sure that you sign up for an account. I know that both of those sites have been sending me lots of stuff the last couple of days um, to get ready for the hour of code. So you can sign up for an account and access the free resources that they have available for teachers. Um, another one that I like for beginning readers is Tinker, and that's T-Y-N-K-E-R. Um, and they have a couple of different versions. That's, again, both a web-based tool and they have an iOS app. And um, Candy Quest is one of the ones that's an easier game, so that'd be great for like first, second grade um, students. There's a little bit more reading involved in that, so just be aware of that. Um, what else? What, what about for older kids? Um, I've used Scratch or Scratch Junior. Um, we, I actually used Scratch with my middle school kids, and so they were able, that one definitely has um, layering, and you um, pick sprites is what they're called, and so you can design a sprite, and then you can put the layering as far as like the backgrounds, and you can put shapes in, and, and we talked a little bit about how we could, you know, make story and writing prompts even with, with using Scratch. Yeah, Scratch is a great one, and that is exactly where I would use that, is to give the kids a writing prompt and then have them quote a scr quote a Scratch story. Um, Scratch also does have, that's a web-based tool, but they also have an app. Um, it's um, PBS Scratch Junior, I think think yeah. is the one for iOS that would work for littles. But that one, I don't believe, and Scratch on the web too, um, Codable and the Foos um, and Tinker really provide step-by-step -step tutorials, whereas Scratch is a little bit more wide open. So I would definitely start with something maybe before I got to Scratch. Um, they all basically use block-based coding, um, which is what Scratch is built on. So it would be good to move up to something like Scratch. Um, let's see, Josh Allen. <laughs> <laughs> you see Josh? You did, yes, yes, you did let me get there, Josh. <laughs> yes, um, so Josh mentioned that Codable syncs well with Google Classroom, and we appreciate that. And as the NIDA board member, I'll let you mention the next thing. <laughs> um, so our NIDA conference in, um, in the spring, we have um, – Hattie coming for um, one of our speakers. So I'm super excited, the founder of uh, Code.org. And so we are so very excited to have him um, come join us and, and offer that to all of our, our uh, conference attendees. 
Yeah, and I will mention that Hattie also was made an appearance at ISTE this summer, and um, he brought R two D two. So, and my husband is like cute, and I've got my Star Wars lanyard on today because I'm going to go do a Star Wars activity with the classroom here this afternoon. Uh, but my husband and I, we actually missed R two D two. My husband is a huge Star Wars fan. So, do we know if R two D two is coming along with Hattie to Nita? You know, I don't know that, but maybe we could peer pressure him into that. <laughs> or, you know, just any, BB-8. I mean, that'd be awesome, Something, too. Something, right? Yeah, just, just anybody from Star Wars. Just come on down. <laughs> um, okay, so our topic today was Hour of Code Google Style. So I'm actually, we don't normally do a screen share or a demo during these <laughs> things because Otis and I are big chickens and we're just not sure it's going to work. But we are going to attempt that today because I do want to go over the Google options for Hour of Code. And there are three of them that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. And we see the first one, which is Made with Code. You see that, Becky? Yes, it looks okay. good from here. All right, fantastic. So Made with Code um, is a Google product, and you can obviously see that right there. Um, but this is actually targeted toward girls. Becky mentioned earlier that um, there's a really big move it, movement to get females into the computer programming um, area. And so Made with Code is Google's attempt at drawing in females. So um, just yesterday, it was still all in pink. Uh, today, they switched to blue. But you can see there's the pink down there. So you'll see that the activity in here are really girly, but I will tell you that I have had boys, third grade boys on this website, and they like it too. So the feature project at Made with Code for this year is Code and Emoji. And I'm going to go in and just look at the other projects that are available. So there's your emoji, which kids love. I don't, I don't know about your kids, but our third and fourth graders are like emoji crazy. So I think they would really enjoy that. The only thing that I'm disappointed with in this, it's only female emojis that you can personalize. So I wish they would add in some more male counterparts to that, but you know, I think you know maybe kids won't mind. Um, but you can see there's a dress, and the ones that I had third grade boys just loving was this Yeti. So you can actually code this Yeti and make him dance and fall down and turn over, and I mean it's just crazy. And so the kids really, really had a good time with this Yeti. But there's the music mixer; uh, they liked that as well. So again, there's you bringing in coding and and adding um, adding the music music mix to it. Um, but again, lots of activities here um, on code. There's beats again. That's more of a music one, two. Lots of activities here on code, on made with code. And you know, Mickey, uh, I tell you mentioned that you had, uh, you know, you had gotten a computer science major, which was, you know, not very typical or, you know, for um, people going through school when you did. And so I love that this gives, um, it, it is a little more girly, but it, it gets, you know, there are girls that are interested in science and math and, and for them to make a connection with maybe something that relates to them in their life, it makes such a big difference to make strong, you know, and powerful young women. Absolutely, absolutely. So that is uh, Google's um, targeting females specifically in that one. The next one we're going to look at is Google CS First, uh, Computer Science First. And this is all about providing a club experience, like an after school club experience for students. And it gives you everything that you need to know to put together this club um, and code with students. It gives you all the materials, it gives you pub um, publicity information. And again, this one is designed for grades four through eight, so ages nine through 14. Um, and I really think that's about where you need to start with this one. Um, this uses Scratch. So Becky and I mentioned Scratch earlier. Uh, this is built on using the same Scratch language that they would use uh, if they were coding at the Scratch website. So um, if we go into this, again, there are multiple projects that kids can code. Um, the one that they have put out for Hour of Code this year is Gumball's Coding Adventure. Now apparently, now I don't have kids, so I don't know this, but apparently the Cartoon Network has a show about Gumball, Gumball's Adventure, and um, this is based, this is a um, partnership with uh, Cartoon Network and uses the characters from this TV show um, that kids can code. So Becky, I think your kids are probably too little for Gumball. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so neither Becky or I have any idea about Gumball, but 
Um, it looks to be fun. Now, from other webinars that I visited, uh, the storytelling one, storytelling one is a basic one that would be good for a beginner. Um, and it also mentions that the high seas activities would be a good first one to try. But you can see they have several different, again, combining art, music, sports, um, the animation one is in beta, game design, you know, those are all things that kids would like to do. So um, that CS first is the second one that we are referencing. Comments on that one, Becky? I That one, I think you're right, is definitely for um, those older kiddos. And, and just, and I played with that one just a little bit, but I think it's got some really good potential. All right, the last one is actually probably my favorite one. And this is not one that you would think would have coding activities tied to it, but it is Google's Santa Tracker. Now, um, you can thank me later because this will be a huge time suck for all of you between now and December 24th uh, because they release a new activity every day. And the last two years, one of their daily activities has been around coding. And so when Becky and I were talking about doing this webinar, I said, you know, I, I don't know, they haven't released it yet, and I'm not sure if there's gonna have a coding something, you know, in it. And I went on this morning, and sure enough, this activity right here, uh, you can uh, code boogie. Um, with some elves. So uh, you can, so you go to the dance class first to kind of learn how to do it. And then you can go through, there's 10 different levels. Um, and then you can go through and um, code the elves to dance. So you can see, again, it's using that block based coding. So there's your when run block, and then you can add the um, which movement that you want them to make um, and stack it up just like the a lot of these activities are um, block based activities and this one is no different. So that is actually that was actually released yesterday. Um, that was the very first day uh, that it was out and it does look like if you scroll down here this looks maybe a little code like back here so they might have another code activity for you um, later on in the month but um, there's all, all sorts of things that you can do here but i did the code boogie before we went live and it's kind of fun so i think your kiddos would like that now good luck keeping them at the code boogie <laughs> You know, if you show them Santa Tracker, um, I'm not sure you're going to be able to get them off of that. But it is it is a fun one. Yes. I, like you said, that one just came live, so I haven't played with that one. But I saw it this morning, you know, and I've looked at the ones in the past, and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to try that one. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was pretty fun this morning. So um, those are your options for coding Google style. Um, I think any of them would work for, you know, probably I like I mentioned, I did um, made with code with as young as third graders. So I think you're hitting that third grade on up range on any of these Google products. Um, but they also do a really nice job of providing you with a lot of materials resources and things that you can use um, to help yourself learn to code and then use it with your students. So Google has done a really great service by providing these materials and obviously like most of everything in Google, they're all free. Um, so just go to the website and access them. So we love that when it's free, right? Oh, definitely. And I think that brings up, an, you know, such a nice point that, you know, it is there. There's these resources. So if you haven't done this before, there is that help for you. So go try it out yourself, see what fits your level of kids best or your, even your group, you know, because each one of our groups or our classrooms of kids are different. Figure out what fits you think the best and then go from there. Yeah, and I, and I think for teachers, initially they think that this is going to be some big daunting task oh my god i could never learn how to code um becky and i actually just did a training session for our teachers here in norfolk and we we didn't have a big group but we had five teachers none of them had ever coded before and they were all just enamored with this code.org tutorial that they were working on and um they loved it and they they decided right then and there that no it wasn't really as hard as what they thought it was going to be coming in so um give it a try and i think that if you then turn around and try it in your classroom with your students, you'll be sold on what this activity can do. And it's definitely that it, it offers so many extensions. So if this is something that, you know, it doesn't have to just be in the hour of code in December, you know, this kicks it off and then it can be used throughout the rest of your school year. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I love starting with things like the tutorials on code.org 
um, and the other apps that we mentioned, Codable and the Foos and some of those, and then moving into something like Scratch because Scratch could be used the rest of the year. You know, like we said, give them a writing prompt, give them a story that they have to code because Scratch is about creating scenes and characters and having those characters do things and interact. Um, and, and that could be something that they use the rest of the rest of the year. Um, and not only add that computer science piece of it, but tie that to something that they're doing anyway in, in their classroom. Yes, I'm so excited for everybody. I can't wait to, to see what happens over the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And if you do try some of these things, you know, be sure that you're sharing. Either go to our G Google Plus page and share right there or tweet it out. Um, you know, it, it's always great to see the things that teachers are doing in their classrooms. And I know I just um, referenced uh, somebody had uh, reminded me of this video um, and the the. the thought is um, it what's ordinary to you might be extraordinary to somebody else so just because you think oh that's not that's nothing special it might be to somebody else you might inspire somebody else to do something so make sure you're sharing what you're doing take a picture of your kids uh, tweet of your kids coding and tweet it out add it to our Google Plus page blog about it um, just share what you're doing Yes, teachers notoriously are, you know, they say we're not braggers, you know, we don't, we don't show all the awesome, cool things that are happening in our schools and, and you get these great ideas and the only way to do that is by sharing what you're doing. So please, please, yes, share it out however your, your district does, tweet us, put it on the Google um, page, that would be great for us to see. Well, we are at the end of our half an hour time. We like to try and keep these to a half an hour and that we're at the end of our time. So I want to thank Becky for joining me today for our Great Plains Google Educator Group Hangout on Air. Thanks, Mickey. And to all of you watching or who will watch this recording later, if you have any ideas for topics that we can discuss via Hangout on Air, please leave them on our Google Plus page and Otis and I will be happy to discuss them and we might even invite you to join us. So thank you all for visiting and for watching today.